morning, it's always a great privilege when we can come before God to worship him and praise him in the midst of the rain and everything. We can only thank God because we can see it as showers of blessings. Amen. I just want to acknowledge our viewers on YouTube and um, Facebook. Though you may not be here in person, but we believe that you are still part of the church family. And I want to take this opportunity to welcome each and every one of you. You could have chosen any other platform, but you decided to stick with us this morning for our lesson studies. So I just want to say that we do appreciate your time with us. Before we go any further, I would like to introduce to you my panelist, um, Ed uh, Alan, who is going to help me work together to discuss this lesson. We are not here to teach. We are here to moderate. So we need everyone to participate so that it can be very interactive. Let us begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us this privilege this morning to open your word. Lord, as we are going to continue our studies on the great controversy, we invite your spirit to be with us. Because without the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon our life, we may not be able to understand your word and apply it in our life. So as we go into our studies, we are seeking your face, Lord. Please, have mercy on us. Give us a deeper understanding so that when we leave this place, we can apply these lessons into our personal life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We are on our third um, lessons for this quarter. And the title of the lesson is, Light Shines in the Darkness. Light Shines in the Darkness. And we all know that when you have um, daytime, we then turn on the light. Daytime, we don't switch on the light. We only switch on the light when it's what? Dark. That simply means that when there's darkness, then the light shines for you to see. It helps you to see. And this is what this lesson is all about this morning. The memory test is from John chapter 12, verses um, 35. It says, then Jesus said to them, a little while longer, the light is with you. Walk whilst you have the light. Lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he's going. That simply means that if you walk in darkness without light, you won't be able to know where you're going. And that is a reality of life that sometimes we may think we are in the light, but most often we are in darkness. That simply means we don't know where we are going. And if you don't know where you're going, you'll be wandering all over the place because you have no purpose. You walk aimlessly. And our lesson this morning is going to give us the opportunity for us to dive into these studies to understand that we need the light in our lives in order for us to know and have a purpose where we are going. The lesson says that in the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, the devil is depicted or pictured as a dragon and a serpent. A dragon in the... Um, He's a dragon because he desires to destroy God's people. And he's a serpent because he uses all his cunning lies to deceive. So a dragon destroys and a serpent what? Deceives. In the years after Christ's death, thousands were tortured, thrown in, um, to lions and burned at the stake by imperial Rome for refusing to worship its deities. Yet in the face of this cruel punishment, Many stayed faithful. The gospel continued to spread, and the church grew. So whilst they were being tortured, in the midst of all the devil's um, plans to kill Christianity, the gospel even spread more. The more he tried to suppress it, the wild it becomes, and the whole world got to know about it. Because when people escaped persecution, when they were running for their lives, wherever they went, they went with the message. And that is something that, as we begin our lessons this morning, I want us to take note of that. That if we do not go on our own accord, God sometimes tears us our nest, cause persecution for us to move. And in the course of that moving, we go with the message. We have the experience of the children of Israel when they were supposed to let the entire nations around them to know the God they serve. And they decided to protect the gospel. They didn't want anybody to come close to them. The Lord, God allowed them to go into captivity in Babylon. 
And in the course of that captivity, the entire world got to know about God. So if we do not go on our own merit, something will push us. God will find a way for us to go. And this lesson is saying that as a result of Satan's change, um, as a result of this, Satan changed his strategy. When this did not work out, and he saw that the gospel is even spreading greater, he decided to come up with a new idea. And that idea was um, scores of pagans, non-believers, got baptized so that they can come into the church and infiltrate the church. So the idea is that when you see somebody from outside coming in or saying something, you may be careful. But in, in this case now, they got baptized, they became members of the church. So now the issue is not an outsider's, but people within. And the lesson says that, but throughout, um, but without thorough instructions in the Bible truth, error flooded into the church as leaders merged the truth of scripture with popular customs. So these people got baptized into the church without the proper teachings. They did not understand the word. And therefore they came with their pagan worship into the church and infiltrated the church. So now you have the truth and the error being merged together. And we all know that they cannot be half truth. It's either truth or lies. But they merge together. And that is the, one of the ways that the devil uses to get into us as Christians. So as we continue with our lessons, I want to invite Ed Alan, if you want to add anything into the introduction before we go into Sunday's lesson. Uh, good morning, church. Good morning. Uh, <laughs> what I will say, Pastor Abia, is we live in a world of darkness. We all need the Jesus. We all need the light to help us to see where we're going, yep. to help us to understand what's going on around us. We need the light, and the light will give us knowledge because without knowledge, we'll perish. Amen. Amen. Is there anybody who would like to add anything to the introduction of the lessons before we go into Sunday's lesson? I want us to be engaged. It's not, we are not here to teach. We are here to moderate. Okay. Moving on to Sunday's lesson says compromise, Satan's subtle strategy. And if we look at John chapter 14, verse 6, it says, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So this simply means that Jesus was very specific. There is no alternate. Either you come through me or no other way. And this is a very profound declaration for Jesus to say that you can only come to the Father through me. And without me, there is no other way. Then if we go to John 8 uh, verse 44, it says, You are of your father the devil, and you want to do the desire of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. And it says, whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So this is now talking about Satan. So we have first Jesus saying that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the father except by me. Then John 8 verse 44 is talking about the chief of all liars, the father of all liars, in the person of who? Satan. Who comes in to deceive? So now there's a contrasting <clears throat> element between Satan and Jesus. One comes in to bring you life. Another one comes in to deceive and to what? To destroy. And as Christians, this is where it becomes very tricky for us to understand that Truth proceeds from the heart of all wise and all knowing and all, um, all loving and all knowing God. He is the foundation of reality and all truth. So God is the foundation of all truth. While Satan is the foundation or the father of what? Lies. So the contrast is clear for you and I to see. And it says in contrast, Satan is a liar and the father of all lies. He is prepared to use lies, deceit, misinformation and distortion of truth to lead God's people astray. He deceived even um, Eve in Aden by distorting truth. When he approached Eve in the Garden of Eden, he distorted the truth. 
He says, if you eat of this fruit, you will never what? You shall not die. And the truth is, Eve did not die. Even the concept of death was new to them. Because death was not part of God's creation. So God, Satan came to her and said to her, if you eat of this fruit, your eyes will what? Open and you will not die. And Eve ate the fruit. And at that point, physically, she did not die. But the death that God was talking about wasn't just the only physical death. It was the what? Spiritual death. So in effect, Satan picked up something that is true and distorted it. Oh, it's so nice. It's sweet. And then change it a little bit so that you can think of, oh, this is right. You know, let me think about it. Then all of a sudden you find out that it's not true. When you are in school and you do exams and there's true or false questions, you see that most of the questions, it may sound so true. Then they will change one word. And the whole thing becomes what? False. And that is the deception of Satan in this test. And he says it's very what? Subtle. Very gradual. That you, it's difficult for you to even know. And as Christians, sometimes we think, oh, we know it all. But it comes to you at a time and at a point where you think, oh, this is right. Oh, maybe I need to look at this, you know. But the reality is that they cannot be half truth. It's either true or lies. And if we look at it, um, say Satan well knew that the Holy Scriptures would enable men to descend his, decep um, de his deception and withstand his power. That is why he's attacking the word of God. Because the word of God is the only true source of truth that we know that will lead us into righteousness. So if he attacks that, then where do we stand? Everything will be over. And that is the how subtle that deception is. And as Christians, we need to watch and pray. Because it's happening to us now, and which the lesson is going to go a little bit deeper into that. So, Adala, let me bring you in now. If we compare John 14, verse 6, and then John 8, verse 44, what contrast between Jesus' character and Satan's character is seen in these two passages? Hey, thank you, Pastor Yeah, uh, You have already elaborated on the contrast. I'm going to just add. <laughs> to yeah. add. So, <clears throat> when we look at Jesus' character, it, it considerably differs from Satan's. Because Jesus is the light, and Satan symbolizes the darkness. When it comes to the relationship with God, relationship with God, our Father, our Creator, Jesus is the perfect example for obedience, for faithfulness, for love. <coughs> Why <coughs> Satan showed us rebellion? toward God, disobedience toward God. So Jesus is not only our model when it comes to our relationship with God, but Jesus is the door that leads us to God. We have to go through Jesus to go to God. And as uh, Pastor Apia said earlier, when we read uh, John 14, verse 6, <coughs> we can see Jesus said unto him, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So if we turn our back on God, we serve the other master. When we turn our back on God, we serve the other master because there are only two masters. And then this is the reason why the word of God says, in Matthew 6, verse 24, no one can serve two masters, for either you will hate the one and love the other. So if we choose to disobey God, to not do his desire, he is not our master. We may be his creatures, but we are not his sons, we are not his daughters. Because everybody on earth are God's creatures, but not everybody is God's son or God's daughter. 
That's why if we disobey God, we have another father, not God the creator. And in the, Jesus said it in John chapter 8, verse 44. And I read, you are of your father, the devil. Why you are of your father, the devil? Because you disobey God. God is not your father. The devil is your father. God is not your master. The devil is your master because, as I said earlier, there are only two masters. And then we continue. The devil, and you are of your father, the devil. And the desire of your father, you want to do. You don't want to do the desire of God. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. So, Jesus' characters differ very much, considerably, from Satan's character. Because Jesus is the light and Satan is the darkness. Thank you so much, Edda. So, if we are made, continue on from there, it says, buy truth and do not sell it. And this is Proverbs 23, verse 23. Because Jesus is the truth. So, if you accept him, you are buying it. It says, get wisdom and instruction and understanding. Mm -hmm. That simply means that in order for us to appreciate and know the truth, you need to um, know the counterfeit, you need to know the truth. Let me use an analog analogy of gold. We have counterfeit gold, and those who deal in gold, if you are not careful, somebody can come to you and sell fake products to you. Even, let me use a term that young people will understand. When you want to buy um, trainers, we have the Nike and all these top uh, brands that young people like. There are counterfeits of that. If you go to places like, um, I need to be careful what I say. <laughs> you may end up buying Nike for maybe whatever dollars, but you may get home and find out that it wasn't original, it was counterfeit. So the question is, how do you differentiate between the original and the counterfeit? In order for you to know that the product that you're buying is of quality, you need to know the symbol, you need to know the details of that product in order for you to be able to differentiate between the two. If not, somebody will sell you a product that you may end up getting home and it will be completely different thing. I'm from Africa and in some of our marketplaces, you go to a shop to buy something like a trainer and trainers, they, you see it, they will show you the original and you look at it and say, oh, I like this. And then you pay for it. By the time you turn around, they will change it and give you something fake. So you get home and you find out that what you saw in the market is completely different from what you took home. And when, so when we are talking about buying the truth, we are talking about being sincere, knowing exactly the God that you serve. Before somebody comes to you and twists it for you and deceives you, which the devil is very subtle of doing. Ed Palmer. Yes, uh, thanks, Pastor. Um, just to add a comment here um, about the great controversy. The, there are many in the world today who are not aware, who have not acknowledged that there is a conflict, a cosmic conflict, you might say, going on, something that we cannot see with our eyes, and that all of us are involved mm -hmm. in that conflict. There's a battle going on between God and Satan, between good and evil for our souls. And the devil is not uh, giving up, we should say. And many times the devil is de depicted in movies or in cartoons as, you know, um, a beast with a tail and horns. And, and many people look at it as comical. But the devil is, is, is not an ugly beast with with horns and tail. No. The devil was created one of the most beautiful angels, the Bible says. And he's very cunning. And because of that, he's using deception. And many people will tell you, oh, I, I am not a sinner. I don't kill. I don't, I don't this, I don't that. But like Brother Allen quoted from what Jesus said, if you are not on, on God's side, automatically, there's no middle ground. You are on the devil's side. So uh, it begins, I believe, with us as human beings acknowledging that there's a cosmic conflict, there's a battle, there's a war raging, and we are at the center of it. 
So we can't take a neutral position. We have to be aware that it's either we stand for God or by default we are on the devil's side. Amen. Amen. And the lesson says that um, even Christ himself, it says, Ellen G. White quotes in the Great Controversy, page 51, it says, At every assault, Christ presented the shield of eternal truth, saying, It is written. So Christ himself has to depend on the word of God mm -hmm. by quoting the Bible, not from himself. Though he is God, but the human element of him propelled him to depend on the word of God. And when he was tempted, he says, it, it is what? Written. Man shall not live by bread alone. It is written. So in order for us to be protected, we need to know the word, the truth. Because it says thy word is the truth. And if we're able to do that, then we can, in turn, um, effect, use the same word to stand mm -hmm. against the devil's deception. But if we are to depend on our own strength, then we will be deceived. So the lesson talks about, it says, discuss the, um, what ways Satan's attempts or try to distort and misinterpret God's word for us today. So, Brother Alan, if you look at it now, what are some of the ways that Satan is trying to distort the truth? and misinterpret the word for us today. Thank you. If we look around, but before we look, we know that Satan, since the beginning of time, the beginning of our time, Satan, what he's doing, he's been doing, he's been trying to distort, to misinterpret the word of God. But now if we look around, we see he's still doing that. But as Pastor Apia said earlier, he's very subtle. He does think that if you don't pay attention, you will not see the truth. You have to closely pay attention. For example, when we look around, we see the mega churches. We see what they preach. They preach about a gospel of prosperity. Gospel of prosperity. They let the members know, if you believe in God, you can have health. You can have wealth. You can have comfort just to believe in God. But this is not what the truth said. This is not what the word say. Because they, by doing that, by teaching like that, they fail to preach about reconciling with God through Jesus Christ. They fail to preach about keeping the commandments of God. They don't focus on that. Just believe in God and everything will be done because God is able to do everything. It's not only that. It's not just that. It will be too easy. And they don't preach about doing the desire of God. They don't preach about the Holy Spirit. How, we, how can we behave so the Spirit of God can live in us. Because the word, the truth, say our body don't belong to us. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So we cannot do whatever we want with that body. And then we will make the Spirit of God sad and to leave us. Because the Spirit of God being pure cannot live in something that is impure. That's not pure. They fail to teach about that. But as I said earlier, we have to pay close attention to see that. Because everybody will say, oh, yeah, I believe in God. Because everybody wants to be rich. Everybody wants to have wealth. Everybody wants to have comfort, but just to believe in God. And the other thing I will say, a a way they misinterpret the word of God, it is to make people to celebrate a lot of so-called Christian festivities. I said so-called Christian festivities because sometimes we think that those celebrations, they have to do something with the Bible. But when we see, we see that has nothing to do with the Bible. It's tradition, and Jesus said it. It's going to be a time that people, they will prefer to obey to tradition in, instead of doing God's commitments. So we have to be 
careful when we look around to not get trapped in Satan's, uh, I would say that. Deception. 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 Thank you. Okay. Ed and Max. Um, the deception, like Elder Allen said, is something that we have to watch for. And we have an example with the Bereans, how whenever somebody told them something, they went to the Bible. Because deception can only work when you don't know. So mm -hmm. the only way I can deceive you is I know something you don't know, mm -hmm. and then I can deceive you. But if we know the same thing, I can't be deceived. Amen. And so that's why you see sometimes people deceive people on the end of making God very loose, but they also deceive God people with God being very strict. They say, oh, if you don't adhere to every single thing, if you don't let, you know, go through the rough patch, this is how you're going to make it. God tells us that the path he takes is rough because of the circumstance that we are on earth. Mm -hmm. But if he takes on the, lo the load for you, it'll be easy for you to do his work. You don't have to do it. Right, but they make it seem like, oh, you have to do, you know, what what God wants you to do. No, well, the only way we can hold on to God's word and listen to what He says is if we give ourselves to Christ. Amen. We can't do it ourselves, Amen. right? So they say they they make it seem like you don't have to do anything. Then they make it seem like you have to do everything yourself, mm -hmm. and both of them are wrong. It's mm -hmm. you have to give Christ, and Christ will make you do the right things. Amen. Amen. I, I watch uh, somebody send me a video clip from T D Jakes. And T.D. Jakes was addressing the issue of Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And I was so amazed and surprised to find out the way he was mocking the Sabbath. That I keep Monday as a Sabbath, I keep <laughs> Tuesday as a Sabbath, I keep any other. And people, were, the members were shouting, and, and I'm like, really? In the church? <laughs> so th this is how the devil deceived people. Mm -hmm. And he says, any day you take it off as a day of rest is your Sabbath. Yes, the word Sabbath simply means rest. However, when we are talking about biblical rest, biblical Sabbath, it's different from a day of rest. Amen. So when you decide to stay at home and any other day, it does not make it the Sabbath. And he, he was talking about it, and the members were making mockery mm -hmm. of God's word. And this is how the devil comes in to deceive. So let's move on now. Uh, Monday's lesson talks about the savage wolves within the church. Mm -hmm. So Ed Allen, can you give us a summary of Monday's lesson and then we go into deeper discussion of that? Yeah, as we are talking about the deception from the devil, how the devil is going to deceive us? The devil is deceiving, deceiving us through false prophet, through false shepherd, through false pastors. That how... Because the devil is not going to come directly to do his work. He chooses people to do his work for, for him. But Monday lesson is, a, uh, is about the warning given to us, to the churches, regarding false prophet, false shepherd. This is Monday lesson. And uh, Jesus uh, alerts us in Matthew 7, verse 15, when he says, be aware of false prophet who comes to you in sheep's clothing, but in what they are ravenous wolves. They are not really sheep. The devil do his deception through false prophet, false shepherd, that we have to be careful. Monday lesson is about that. Okay, and then taking it a little bit further, when we look at it now, so the issue is, it's not about the enemy out there, it's the mm -hmm. enemy within. Mm -hmm. And Paul warns the church against that. Paul counseled them to say that the wolves are going to come, the enemy is going to come within you, and then false doctrines uh, uh, will be substituted with the divine truth. And this is exactly what we are seeing in our churches today. Now, within, and I'm not, I have to be careful how I put this. Mm. When you go to Seventh-day Adventist church, you have to be very careful of every message that you receive. Because not every preacher mm -hmm. will be from God. Mm -hmm. Not every preacher who stands from the pulpit is preaching from, that says the word. Amen. I've had an experience where somebody was invited to preach. And after the sermon, I felt so uncomfortable that I have to do second sermon. <laughs> because I felt that it wouldn't be right for me to leave the congregation to go home mm -hmm. with that message. And that is the kind of, and I'm talking about Seventh-day Adventist mm -hmm. elder, somebody in good standing in the church. So we, 
the Bible says that we should study to show ourselves approved, a workman that needed to be what? Ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. Mm -hmm. That simply means that now, even when somebody quotes a passage, you need to check with your Bible to make sure that it's the right word that the person is what? Amen. Preaching. Amen. When we look at it from Acts chapter 20, verse um, 30, it says, also of your own <clears throat> self um, shall man, men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. And so within, people will come and stand and preach and draw people to themselves. Mm -hmm. And we've seen it happening over and over again. People got, get to the point where they feel so big that they have to even leave the church and set up their own congregation. I've seen some people within the Adventist church where they believe that they have direct link to God. Mm. And everything they say is from God. Mm -hmm. And nobody can advise them. When they pray, it's final. And they lead, that leads them to set up their own even prayer camp. When the church says that, no. I have dealt with somebody in my congregation who believes that God speaks to her directly from God. And I said, no, that cannot be true. Because if the word needs to be in align with the word of God. So if God is saying to you, and you are talking about somebody's marriage and all kinds of false prophet, no, I can't sit down and say that that is from God. <laughs> because the Bible says by their fruit, you shall what? know them. And God is not God of um, disorder. When I stood up against the person and I said no, I was surprised that some people that I thought were in quote, that is, this is their warning because Paul sent it to them, that they will know the truth and stand up for what is right, supported her. And I sat at the board and I could not believe it. And somebody even made reference that I am quenching the spirit because Ellen G. White started the same way. <laughs> Making me be, come across as I'm the devil. Mm -hmm. And this person will come to you and says, oh, I saw your husband going under the sea and naked and all kinds. And I'm like, where is this spirit coming from? <laughs> And I know that from the word of God, that spirit cannot be from God. So when we are talking about um, the wolves within us coming in to deceive, mm -hmm. it's very, very subtle. And the devil comes in. I have a pastor that I work with. He's my intern. I'm mentoring him. I met him. We meet first Monday of every month. We met last month. And he was sharing with me of his own experience of something like that that he is dealing with in his church of an elder who has kind of went <laughs> all over. So what I'm saying to you this morning is, as we are talking about this, the enemy outside is easier to identify. It's easier to stand against. But the enemy within is completely different. And that is where the danger is. That within our church nowadays, so many things are happening that we need to study to understand the word of God. When it comes to even the issue of um, LGBTQ plus or whatever, it's on a different level. I've sat in a meeting, Adventist meeting, family life training, where somebody in the upper echelon of the church did a presentation, and in his presentation, he was giving a different categories, people who are born like this, people who are born like that, and then in the middle, by virtue of their birth, you can't discriminate against them because they are born like that. And I'm talking of somebody in, uh, up there within the Adventist hierarchy. And I sat down and said, no, this is not right. I went to him and challenged him after the presentation. He told me, he looked at me. He's somebody who taught me in school. He was my professor, so I know him personally. He said to me, Sam, you may not understand it now, but with time you will get it. And I said, I don't, I'm not sure of that. So we, the time has come for us to stand for what we believe and not look at somebody or the church. Or, it's about you and your God. Amen. Amen. So going forward now, the last um, question says, what kind of compromises do we see entering in the church today? More important, what compromise might you be making? Is it 
sometimes blended truth and error? Do we see other compromises creeping into the church that we as Christians need to be careful of as Seventh-day Adventist believers in the days that we live in? Are there any other compromises that are scary that we can think of? I've mentioned a few of them. One thing that comes to mind, Pastor, um, so I have heard uh, many people advocating um, that as Christians, we should come together. All Christian denominations um, should come together because we believe in Christ. Mm -hmm. And the Bible tells us that we should test everything and hold fast that which is good. And Isaiah 8 and verse 20 says, the law and the testimony is the test, meaning the scriptures. The word of God is the test that we use to check everything. Amen. And that means doctrines are important. Because doctrines are, are, are from the scriptures. They are formed based on the, what the scripture teach about a certain subject. That's how you arrive at doctrines, by, you know, looking through the Bible and, and putting all the, 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 the information together on a certain um, topic, and that become a doctrine. Now, one thing I, I have heard, and it is said at a time when somebody is looking for comfort, like at funeral services, where somebody will say, don't mourn, your, your mother's up, up there smiling down on you. And, and this, you know, it might be words of comfort, but it's not biblical. So, so, so we have to be careful because if we're not, you know, we can, we can be drawn into trying to comfort somebody by telling them something that is not true. Mm -hmm. And if, even when we sing, let, let, me, let, me, let me put it this way. We have, there are messages that we convey in the songs that we sing. So uh, not our gospel music, we can sing as the people of God. Because the message in the music can be carrying a doctrine that the Bible does not teach. So we have to be careful about what we uh, endorse, what we teach. Not because it says Christian, it's labeled as Christian. Because Paul is saying here in this verse, in, in, um, in Acts chapter 20, that grievous wolves will arise from amongst you and teach things that are perverse to draw away disciples after themselves. So Paul said, be careful. They're not going to be coming from outside. Your own people, your own Christian brethren will arise and start teaching some of these things that will divide the church. So be careful. Amen. Just to add a point, uh, uh, Pastor Avia. Sure. Uh, to what you just said, uh, Elie Palmer, when you say that when we comfort someone, uh, was uh, his loved one pass. And most of the time, if we don't, <laughs> we are not careful, we can say that your loved one is in the arm of God, smiling, looking at us. Now <laughs> you need to be comforted. But this is not their life for certain. Because remember what uh, he said to Eve, if you eat the fruit, if you eat from the fruit, you, should, you shall not die. But now, if eat the food, if die, he came up with another lie. When we die, you die. You go, go, you go straight to God. That's another lie of Satan. I, I think the, the state of the dead is something that many Adventists still struggle with. That I went to a program last year, and it was an Adventist um, person being recognized for his service. And the person said, oh, I wish my mother was here. And he went on to say that, oh, I know that you're up there, you're watching, and you're looking up to me. And I'm like, really? Mm -hmm. And th so this is something that we all believe, people quote it out of context. And so if somebody, the dead person is up there and they can see you suffering, mm -hmm. how would they be comfortable in heaven <laughs> to see your children going on suffering in this world? All these things, oh, your, your, your dead person, uh, family member is in a better place. Why don't you die? <laughs> these are some of the stuff that we all go through and we hear it 
and we don't take our time to study the word. And we go through it each day. And so when we are talking about deception, it's coming from all angles, mm -hmm. all angles. People are being deceived, mm -hmm. and we don't even pay attention to it. When moving on to Tuesday's lesson, it's a very interesting topic. It says, safeguarded by the word. And this is something that we've mentioned earlier, that the only thing that can safeguard us is the word of God. However, the devil, Satan, because of his cunning nature, is now attacking even the word of God itself. Mm -hmm. Because if the word of God is under attack and people don't believe in the word, then where lies our feet? The Bible says that um, the, um, the Bible itself is infallible, a revelation of God. So this is the revealed will of God. And it says it is, all scriptures is given by the inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instructions in righteousness. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And the key word is all. All scriptures. Not part of it, not some of it. All of them were given. But now the devil is attacking the word of God to the point that people are questioning God. Oh, the Bible was written by farmers, kings, and all these people, and it cannot be the word of God. If it's the word of God, why does it contain all this kind of foolishness of David cheating and all those things? It cannot be the word of God. Especially in um, Gen Z, young people's mind, they are now questioning the authenticity of the Bible. Is the Bible the word of God? And as soon as you challenge the authority of the Bible, that simply means that your faith is gone. Because our faith is based on the word of God. And this is what is happening in our world today. Let me go a little bit deeper. That sometimes people even argue over the various versions of the Bible, the translations. I don't know what is your take on it. Somebody said to me, Pastor, if you preach from any other translation, any other verse of, version of the Bible, and it's not King James, you are sinning. Is that true? No. Yes, there's different translations. Some of them, the words have been um, watered down that sometimes it gives a slight different meaning. However, it's not something that can lead anybody from sinning unless you're using new modern translations that are church-oriented. Some churches have their own Bible where they've translated it to suit their own doctrines. That is completely different. But if you are using King James, which is that says, and you know that old language, and a postmodern person, a young person cannot understand what King James, and they are using NIV or any of this to get a better understanding, I don't see anything wrong with it. So all this comes in where sometimes even we as theologians, as pastors, when I'm doing my sermon, sometimes I'm by, um, one text, I have to look at various translations. And go in, in deeper into the original language to get a deeper understanding of the word. Adam Max. Um, that's a great point you're making, Pastor, about different translations of the Bible. Um, there are some translations that are, like you said, church oriented. That's a nice way of saying it, where they've they've really skewed certain verses to match their yeah. doctrine. But what I found is that the Bible said that no one can take away his word. And what he, he has shown me is that we are supposed to take a little here, a little there to build up a doctrine. And you can use their own Bibles and show that their Bible supports the true doctrine of God. This is how powerful God is. It takes a lot of work. It takes time for you to sit there and, and, you know, and express certain things. But God, even in those translations, God still holds portions that they did not see that support the truth. And so we shouldn't be afraid. Maybe, like, again, when you understand language, you can go back to the original if you have issues. But the Bible, God's word is very pure. If you're looking for it, you will find it. Amen. Amen. Okay, Ed Allen, so if we compare um, John 17, verse 15 to 17, and Acts 20, verse 32, what insight do Jesus and the apostles, Apostle Paul, give us regarding protection from the deception of Satan? Yeah. Thank you, Pastor Abia. The word of God, the word of God, the Bible, which is the truth, will prevent us to be deceived by Satan. 
but we need to know the truth. Yeah. And uh, Jesus has said uh, in John 17, uh, verse 15 to 17, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So Jesus knows that we, <laughs> being in this body, in this envelope, we need to be in this world. We live in this world. But Jesus knows that we don't belong to this world. Because what we see the great majority of people are doing in this world, we, by the grace of God, we shouldn't be part of it. That explain we don't belong to this world as Jesus is not of this world. And uh, to keep us from the evil one, in other words, uh, to not be deceived by Satan. Satan is the evil one. We need to know the truth. We need uh, to know the truth. And the truth is God. And the truth is the word. By uh, what we call uh, trans transitivity. This is relationship between three elements. If the truth is the word and the truth is God, we can conclude that God is the word. God is the word. That means when we read this, we eat the spiritual bread. This is the bread. This is the word. And in that it is said in John chapter 1, verse 1. At the beginning was the word. The word was with God. And the word was God. So, this is God. This is the truth. This is the word. If we need to know the truth, we need to spend time with this. And then the truth will set us free. Free from what? From this world. Free from what? From certain deception. That means everyone, everyone of us, every Christian, every servant of God, to be closer to God, to not be deceived by Satan, we need to spend time in the truth. We need to eat the spiritual bread. Amen. Amen. And if we look at um, Psalms 119 verse 105 says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And the same Psalm 119 verse 116 says, sustain me according to your word that I may live and do not let me be ashamed of my hope. And this is something that we all know that for you to be able to stand against the deception of Satan, you need to know the word. Mm -hmm. And let me go a little bit further to that. You need to also be very mindful of the translation or the interpretation of the word. Because sometimes people can take the Bible text and twist it. Just like how Satan twisted the word to deceive Eve. Mm -hmm. The same word can be used to deceive you. Somebody may quote from the Bible and twist it. Let me give you an example. Um, Acts chapter 20, the story of um, Peter's um, dream. Peter, kill and eat. I have sanctified everything. And many people, as soon as you hear kill, eat, it's what? Food. But when you take your time and read the whole text, it's not about food. It's about race. Mm -hmm. That we are all equal in the sight of God. Because Cornelius was sending his um, servants to Peter, knowing that Peter was a racist, mm -hmm. and Peter was going to reject them. God gave Peter that vision or that dream so that Peter will accept everybody, even if they are Gentiles. So when you hear kill and eat, it's not about food. We talk about the Sabbath. It says, do not, let, uh, do not be judged in Colossians. says, do not be judged in the Sabbath and also in the food that you eat. For I have sanctified everything. And as soon as you hear the Sabbath, why should, am I being judged by the Sabbath? Not knowing that if you go to the Old Testament, there are many Sabbaths. We have the Sabbath of the moon, the Sabbath of the week. There are many Sabbaths. So the Sabbath being referred to is not the Ten Commandments Sabbath. It's the ceremonial Sabbath. Mm -hmm. So you need to be able to understand all this so that somebody cannot quote the same word that we are referring to and interpret it in the wrong way 
to deceive you. And this is what is happening in our church now. Somebody takes one test and run with it. Instead of doing a diligent work, looking at different interpretation, understanding of the word. So when somebody comes to you and you are not sure, take your time and study. Because the word says study to show that I what? Approved. The last part, um, the next question is that um, session, Tuesday's lesson says that what insight does the Psalms give us regarding this? And we all know that it's referring to the fact that we need to trust the word of God. It says, establish my footsteps in your word and do not let any iniquity have dominion over me. Let me be grounded in the word. Let me understand your word. Let me study your word so that nobody can come and what? Deceive me. If you are not grounded in the word, then anybody comes in with anything, you follow it because you yourself don't know what you believe. And that is what is happening in our days now because people go online and YouTube, if you Google, if you go on YouTube, search for Seventh day Adventist, there are so many videos about why I left Seventh day Adventist church, why this, and then you'll be all over the place. And sometimes they are not even telling the truth. Because they left for their own personal reasons. So we need to be grounded in the word so that when you see all those things, especially when it comes to spirit of prophecy, Ellen G. White, oh, there are thousands, numerous of them. That he even copied his word, she's not this and all kinds. You see all of them. The sad reality is those who criticize the writings of Ellen G. White are those who have not even read any of her books. They have no clue about her books and her life or anything about her. And if you want to have a little insight, let me give you a recommendation. There's a little book entitled Meet Ellen G. White, Meeting Ellen G. White by George R. Knight. If you read that book, it's a little book. It won't take you long to read. It will give you an insight into her life, and, and that will help you to believe that when we're talking about prophet, we are not talking about just prophet. We are talking about biblical prophet. So please, as we are going through this lesson, let us study the word so that we cannot be deceived by anybody because the devil is so busy. Moving on to Wednesday's lesson, Ed Alan, I know we are pressed with time. Can you give us a quick summary because we've almost covered that part, human reasoning apart from scripture. Wednesday's lesson is about human reasoning apart from scripture. Uh, this, is talk, this is talking about uh, human knowledge and the divine truth. Human intelligence needs the power of the Holy Spirit to comprehend the word of God, to comprehend the truth. Because the truth is not a matter of human opinion. The truth is a matter of divine revelation. Mm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so when, when we look at it um, in terms of human reasoning, what we also need to understand is that there are two things that leads people astray from God. Wealth and knowledge. Mm -hmm. When people study, I'm talking of academics, when people study and they think they know it all, they cannot be taught by anybody. That is dangerous. The second part is when people get wealthy, when they have money, they are okay. As soon as they get a little money, it's a different story. Because, they, because of their wealth, they don't need God. They don't need mm -hmm. to depend on God anymore. And this is biblical from the time of the children of Israel. Even when they were living in Egypt, the Bible is clear that those who were living a better life, they did not want to leave. When they went to Babylon, the same thing happened. When they were calling for them to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the wall, any, those who were living near the river Euphrates, and they were doing businesses and they were doing well, did not want to hear anything about Jerusalem. Why? Because they were living better life. When people start to acquire wealth, there's a danger that you may lose your spiritual relationship with God. I'm not equating poverty with spirituality. You don't have to be poor to be spiritual. That is not biblical. You can still be wealthy and still have a good relationship with God. So let me draw that demarcation. Because we have Abraham was rich. Jacob was rich. All these people were rich in the Bible. And they were still spiritual. They had a good relationship with God. But what I'm saying is that there's a temptation, there's a danger. We are talking about human reasoning. Where people think that they are there, they've achieved, they've acquired knowledge. And because of that, they, don't, they see the Bible as nothing. 
Because in order for you to understand the word of God, it's not only reasoning, it's revelation. God needs to reveal himself to you for you to understand his way. So it goes deeper than just reasoning. Because there are certain things that will not make sense to you. When we talk about Jesus walking on water, and then you think about the density of water, how can Jesus walk on water? It does not make sense. Scientifically, you can't even prove it. But it can be revealed to us. So revelation is different from reasoning. And this is where, as Christians, we need to be very careful when we are talking about our faith in God. It requires faith, greater faith, than even to believe in evolution. <laughs> Eda Pama. Yes, uh, I know you're um, summarizing, but I heard something this week uh, that I, I think, um, you know, this lesson is speaking to, uh, where... They are saying that scientists are, have now discovered um, the, 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 uh, the beginning of human consciousness. They have, they, have, they, uh, they have done studies and research, and now they understand human consciousness. In other words, they know where, they, they now say that they can tell where life begins. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And um, the, the, there's a verse that I want to read here. Uh, quickly um, and this it says here first Corinthians 2 verse 14 but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness unto him neither can they know them because they are spiritually discerned so when when I go to the Word of God in my natural in um, state my natural wisdom as you put it my academic education the word of god is foolishness mm -hmm. to me because the book is spiritual the word is spiritual so you can't use natural application to understand it you need that's why you pray that's why you always go to the the bible prayerfully asking god to send his spirit to reveal to us mm -hmm. what's in the word Amen. um you know one quick thing I heard somebody talking about the days of Noah because the Bible says up until the flood, it had not rained on the earth. No one saw rain before. Mm -hmm. And now this man out of nowhere is preaching that it's going to rain. And that the scientists, all the educated people of the day, were, you know, they were mocking him. <laughs> and they were you know, showing all their, their research and evidence why it is impossible for it to rain. So... You know, just a point to show that human reasoning cannot understand the things of God. Okay. And um, the lesson also affirms that it says that, um, nevertheless, the brilliance of human reasoning alone is incapable of discovering the divine truth. And that affirms, Edda Palmer, your point. Truth is not a matter of human opinion. It is a matter of divine revelation. Amen. Amen. And that is something that we all grapple with. Sometimes people want to make sense out of a situation. And human... Um, canine mind cannot descend that. Mm -hmm. You need divine power, the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to do that. Thank you, Eda Palmer, for that. Amen. Uh, my takeaway of this lesson, I see that this lesson is talking to all of us. It's appealing to all of us because we are living in a world of darkness. And fortunately for us, the light shines in the darkness. How can we see the light? By knowing the truth by reading the words, by spending our time in the words. And then uh, to understand and to comprehend the words, we cannot count on our level of education, as Elder Palmer just said. It's not a matter of uh, PhD degrees. It's not a matter of doctorate degrees. It's the, a matter of the Holy Spirit. We need the wisdom because those people, the scientists, they have wisdom. But this is the wisdom on the earth. This is not the wisdom from above. We need the wisdom from above to be able to understand that. That we need the wisdom. How are we going to get the wisdom from the Holy Spirit? And we need the Holy Spirit not only, not only to understand the word, but we need the Holy Spirit to help us to apply it in our lives. 
It's not a matter of only read the Bible and then we don't do anything with it. We have to live it. Live the way we live our lives is supposed to be according to the words. Sometimes human reasoning is not enough. We need divine revelation. Mm -hmm. And sometimes even within the Adventist community, if you go to most of our theological um, institutions, I've been in a church on Adventist campus where several school lesson is being taught. And one professor will stand up and tell another professor to sit down. This is not your area. This is my area of specialization. I have authority in this area, so shut up. And this is human mind, believing mm -hmm. that your human knowledge is good enough to interpret the word of God, instead of divine, uh, depending on the divine revelation of God. Mm -hmm. And it's my prayer that we will be humble enough, because if you look at the Bible writers, some of them were peasant farmers, commoners, and the Lord was able to use them to write the word. That simply means that God can use each and every one of us to his glory. Amen. 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 Please bow down for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, precious Lord, our God, our Creator. We want to say thank you to you for everything you have done for us. So thank you for this important lesson, God. We have learned a lot from you, God. When we need the power of your Holy Spirit to help us to understand and to apply it in our lives, God. See, today is a communion day, God. This is the day, this is the time you teach us to be humble. And you teach us every time we do that, we will remember you, God. Please help us to understand all this mystery and God to apply it in our lives, God. In the name of your precious son, Jesus, we say this prayer. Amen. Amen. Once again, thank you for your contribution. God bless you. And let's prepare our heart for the next session of the service. Happy Sabbath, church. Right, we're going to have our kids repeat their memory verses. Right, we're going to have the kindergarten. All right. So I watch. God has done for you. Okay. Book 8. Verse 39. 39. Amen. 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 <laughs> Right, we're gonna have a primary. <laughs> God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believed in him shall not perish but have eternal life. John 3 verse 16. PowerPoint. 
For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Acts 13, verse 47. Over to the praise team. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. One more time. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Amen. How are you feeling? I know it's raining, but there's joy in the house of the Lord. Amen. So we're going to start with number one, praise to the Lord. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. We will save that for next week. Happy Sabbath. Please all stand for the call to worship. It'll be taken from John 4, verse 23 and 24. I will read in your hearing. It was John 4, verse 23 and 24. But the hour cometh, and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such a to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. Our merciful Father, we thank you so much for giving us another privilege for us to come before you to worship you. Lord, as we prepare ourselves for our second part of our worship, as we prepare ourselves to dine with you, I pray that you draw closer to each and every one of us. Forgive us of our trespasses, Lord, and accept our worship today. 
In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And now for our affirmation of faith. It will be taken from Exodus 20, verse 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy maidservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger who is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all that it is in the midst, and rested on the seventh. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Amen. Remain standing for our opening hymn, number 493. Like the woman at the well, I was seeking for things that could not satisfy. And then I heard my Savior speaking, draw from my well that never shall run dry.
Praise the Lord. Please be seated. The privilege is mine to welcome you to the house of the Lord today. And if you are not in the house of the Lord, but you are viewing online, I also want to welcome you. I trust that you had a good week. And even if you did not have a good week, the fact that you're alive today is indeed a blessing. So we have to give God thanks for all his benefits towards us. Say amen. 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 All right. I'm going to ask you to do that a few more times, so please pay attention. Now, what does amen mean? Anyone? I agree, so let it be. So it means, therefore, that it's okay to say amen in church, right? Amen. 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 Anybody here found joy in the midst of sorrow, peace in the storm? hope for tomorrow and you have seen it time and time again just say Amen. is there anybody here who has found him faithful Amen. anybody here who knows he's able Amen. anybody here who has been through the fire and you're still alive to testify about it Just say amen. <laughs> amen. We serve a good God. And there is nothing too hard for him to do. He has been faithful to us time and again. And because of that, we are here to worship today. I hope and trust that you will be blessed as you worship God today in this place. I now invite the praise team to do our welcome song. Um, as I invite you to, you know, greet each other you haven't seen after all we haven't seen each other all week is that okay let's greet each other in the name of jesus amen we can go around shake a hand give somebody a kiss we haven't seen each other all week hug at least three people shake at least three hands
Sabbath. I pray everybody had a great week. It's good to see in the crowd all you guys here. Uh, these are the morning announcements for Saturday, April 20th, 2024. On behalf of the health department, if you are feeling unwell, have had a fever in the past 24 hours, or a cough associated with chills or fatigue, please stay home. The full service is available live on YouTube, and when you feel better, please wear a mask in the sanctuary and still, in case you're still contagious. To all board members, there will be a virtual meeting this evening at 6 p.m. Please contact the pastor um, of any depart for any department for any departmental needs. The items um, or items, the Zoom link will be sent out prior. On behalf of the security team, let's continue to keep the middle of the parking lot clear in case of emergency. The handicapped spots needed are to be available for those who need it. If the grassy area of the lot is full, there is more parking at the bank to the left. Please stay vigilant on church property and do not hesitate to let Brother Phil know and his team if you see something. The Brockton SDA Church has launched its very own app. In your phone's app store, search Church App Tidely, and once installed, search for Brockton SDA Church. From there, you will be able to see our bulletin announcements, live stream, and much more. The Adventures and Pathfinders will meet this afternoon at 2 p.m. Please contact Directors Javi and Director Jamila if you have any questions and if your child would not be there. Join us every Wednesday night at 7.30 p.m. on Zoom for prayer meeting. The information is sent out through the church text message service right before we start. For more information, please reach out to Pastor Apia or any of the elders. The food pantry is open to the community on every first, third, and fifth Wednesday of the month. If you are interested in donating or volunteering, please see Sister Palmer. The nurse on duty this morning is Sister Daphne for any medical needs. Pastor Apia has office hours here at Brockton SDA Church every Wednesday from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. To make an appointment, please email pastor at pastor at lsdaco.org to support. To, to request a pastoral visit, please scan the QR code on the screen to complete the visitation form. Get connected to the church text message service. To be notified of church updates during the week for access, text CHURCH to 833-921-9785. That's 833-921-9785. Thank you for your attention and happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Um, in Acts chapter 16, verse 19, we read that Paul had a vision, and he saw a man from Macedonia, and he was saying, come over and help us. 
And Paul concluded that God wanted him to go to Macedonia to spread the gospel there. Brothers and sisters this morning, I want to let you know that there's no shame in asking for help. Amen? Amen. But as children of God, if the deacon department say, we need your help, don't be ashamed to go to them and say, here I am, I'm willing to help. Amen? Amen. When we are Christians and our hearts are converted, we always say to God, here I am, use me. Let that be your aim and motto, that whenever the call is given for help, that we would say, here I am, I'm available to you. And don't just say in word, just mean it and do it, amen? So, and that goes to any department, the pantry, the deaconess, the AY department, whoever is asking for help, let us just say, here I am, use me. Now, when the king um, saw Nehemiah looking sad, he asked him, why are you looking sad? And then Nehemiah explained to him that his walls in um, Jerusalem, they were burnt down. And it was hurting his heart so much that he wanted to rebuild it. And so everyone knows by now that we are building the church. Amen? Amen. We are moving in faith. And this is what I gathered from the story. So when Nehemiah spoke to the king, the king's heart was also touched by Nehemiah's story that he wanted to go home and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And so the king reached out to all his friends in high places so that Nehemiah can get all the materials that he needed to build the walls of Jerusalem. And so I'm asking the church here at Oak Street, I'm asking you to pray that God would reach out, will help us to reach out to all our friends, even if we don't know them yet that they are our friends, that we will reach out to friends in high places so that they can give us the materials that we need and the finances that we need so we can um, construct our building. Amen? Amen? All things are possible with God. Don't forget it. With man, it's impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Now, next week is a high day in Zion. Next week is Personal Ministries Day. What did I say? This Personal Ministries Day. So I want you to invite all your friends to come on out and fellowship with us. We have a special speaker, a very special dynamic speaker awaiting to give you the message. So bring all your friends out. I don't want to see none of the blues here empty. We want this church packed to capacity so that they can hear the word of God. Now May the 11th to the 17th is a week of prayer. And I'm calling upon the elders of the church, the leaders of the church, to help us with this week of prayer. We have two slots available, and we're asking two um, elders or departmental leaders to reach out to us so that those two slots can be filled. It's Thursday night and Friday night. So if I called you or I come to you, you know what you have to say or what you should say to God is not to Sister Holligan. This work belongs to God. And then on May the 18th to the 25th is the revival. We're having a week revival from May the 18th to the 25th. So mark these dates in your calendar. A waiting world, a willing Christ. Christ is there waiting for us to make ourselves ready. Christ is waiting for us to make ourselves ready because he realized that we are not ready. And we must prepare our, prepare our hearts and put our house in order. So remember these dates, and I'm encouraging everyone who's in the play for next week, please meet me immediately after church, and then we're gonna have practice at 5.30 to 6.30 this evening. So all those who are in the play, and if you want to be a part of the play, you can still come because we're looking for passengers to ride on the train, amen? So please stay back and help. I'm asking for help. That's so we can have a dynamic program next Sabbath, Personal Ministries Day. May God richly bless you. We serve a good God what do you say we serve a God who is faithful he has never let us down right he's always on time 
He's our father. Someone says that God is never guilty of child abandonment. It means we are not orphans. Amen. We have a father who is a king. Amen. And Jesus said this in Matthew, St. Matthew, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and he shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receive it. And he that seeketh find it. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or oh, what man is there of you whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to good, give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask? This is time when we take our petitions, our supplications, when we come to God with everything that is on our hearts and we lay them at his feet. I invite you to join me as we pray to our God, to our Father. and father we your children come this morning into your house to worship you it is not about us it is not about the pastor it is not about any leader it is all about you so help us God to forget about ourselves to focus on you and worship you we come, God, confessing our sins because we have all sinned and fall short of your glory. It is only by your mercies that we are not consumed. So we say thank you for your mercies that are new to us each day. Thank you for your grace that kept us. God, we know that the enemy is out there He's not resting. The Bible tells us that he's come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But we thank you for your protection. Because of your protection, we're here today. God, we come in obedience to your command to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. To come together, Lord, as brothers and sisters, to congregate in holiness and to worship at your feet. God, I ask that your presence will be in our midst. We thank you for every blessing. We thank you, God, for life. We thank you for health and strength so that we could get out of bed today and be in this place to worship 
God, we thank you for all the provisions you have made during this week, putting food on our table, keeping shelter over our heads. Father, we thank you for traveling mercies. As we travel the highways and byways each day, we see accidents upon accidents. And we realize, God, that it is only your protection why we are not involved in some of those accidents. So thank you for watching over us, for protecting us. Father, our children are here. Our children, God, are special to us. And we know that the enemy is waging an all-out attack on our young people. God, Jesus, you said, you call upon the young people because they're strong. And the devil knows it, and that's why he's seeking to get them so that they can work for him instead of working for you. But God, I pray that you will once again help the young people to understand, help all you to understand that you have more to give, God. There is more in serving you than living for the devil. Father, we know that you have a, an, an eternal kingdom that is waiting for us to occupy. And you have a place in it for your young people. But Lord, even before that kingdom, we know that there's a work that you have called the youth to do in this time. Father, we remember the three Hebrew boys. They stood tall when everyone else were bowing to an idol. I pray that you will once again bless our youth to stand tall. Lord, help them to make wise choices wise decisions and not just go along with the crowd i thank you father for us as parents many times god we are worried for our children because we see what they're going through god we know that you are able so we commend them to you today put your edge of protection around our children make something beautiful out of their lives Help them to walk into that purpose for which you have created them. Lord, as you said of Jeremiah, that before he was formed in the womb, you knew him and you already mapped out his part in life. I know you have a plan for each of our you today. So I pray, God, you will help them to walk into that part. And us as parents, us as older ones, us as guardians, Father, I pray you will help us, help us to give them the right instructions. To lead by example, Lord. To do the right things when, we, when they are watching. So that they can see that we are not just telling them what to do, God. But we ourselves are practicing what we are telling them. Father, I pray for a mother in this place who might be struggling. Trying to put food on the table. Or even trying to pay for housing. You know the struggles that mothers go through, especially single mothers. I lift them up to you today. Be near, be close, help Lord and comfort our single mothers. And if they are single fathers, I pray the same. I pray for every family, Lord, every household that is here represented. Father, I pray that your presence, that we will create the right atmosphere, the right environment for your Holy Spirit for your presence, for the holy angels to be in our homes so that our homes can be peaceful, our homes can be happy. Lord, that we can have little heaven down here on earth. In a special way, I pray for the visiting ones, those who might be in this audience and those who are watching online. Father, I pray that you will reveal yourself for those who are curious, those who are seeking you, you said, you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. So Lord, help that their hearts may be receptive to your Holy Spirit bidding today. Then Lord, I lift up your manservant on this special day, Lord, when we come to the communion table. I pray that you will give him a word, that you will anoint him once again afresh with your Holy Spirit. You will empower him, God. You will give him a message to speak to us today. And you will help us to be receptive so that we will receive the message gladly. Lord, for whatever I have omitted to ask in your wisdom, 
in your mercy grant unto us according as you see fit and we'll be grateful we'll be thankful because we ask all of this in jesus name amen we're going to do our tithes and offering we honor god by worship him with our offering of thanksgiving return to him his tithes the giving of offering is an expression of our thankfulness to god and the return of tithes is an expression of our faithfulness to him bring you bring your tithes and offering into his presence worship in his place in this way you will learn to live a deep reverence before God, and God is long as you live. Amen.
endure it forever. Father God, I just want to thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy towards us. Thank you, Lord, for always provide for us, Lord. Help us, Lord, that we continue to be faithful and true to you in our tithes and offering, Lord. Continue to bless it that you can go and spread your word, Lord, for your soon coming. Continue to be with us in your precious name. Good afternoon, Happy Sabbath Church. The scripture reading can be found in John 4, verse 27 to 35. It reads, And at this point his disciples came, and they marveled that he talked with a woman. Yet no one said, What do you seek? Or, Why are you talking with her? The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, Come, see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. In the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Therefore the disciples said to one another, Has anybody brought him anything to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me, and to finish his work. Do you not say there are still four months, and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for, for harvest. Thank you, Lyndon, for the scripture reading. Do appreciate it. God bless you. Yeah. Happy Sabbath, church. I just want to take this opportunity to give a shout out to our church clerk, Sister Kimera. This week was her birthday, and I know she's not here today, but I just want to wish her a happy birthday. It's always good to see young people sacrificing their time and everything to the glory of God. And I pray that God will continue to bless her wherever she may be today, that she will have a wonderful experience. I also want to acknowledge the return of um, Brother Josh. Can I, is Brother Josh there? Okay. Um, some of you may not be aware that Brother Josh had a little surgery and um, he has been out of church for some weeks. And it's good to see him back. And Brother Josh, I want to say that our prayers and our thoughts are with you. I know you are not fully there yet, but we are good to see you back. May God bless you for your ministry. Sometimes we don't appreciate people when they are sacrificing everything. When I went to visit him and I saw him, I'm like, wow. And he kept it to himself without telling anybody. And I'm even surprised to see him here today. Praise God for that. We are going to dine with the Lord today. And before we prepare our hearts for the communion service, I want us to spend some few minutes into the word of God as we prepare ourselves for this important service in our church calendar. Our scripture reading that has been read to us by our dear young man, Landon, very eloquently from John chapter 4, verses 27 to 35, is a story that most of us are very familiar with. But this morning, I just want us to focus on a little aspect of this passage. And as we look into that, it will help us to prepare ourselves for this service. I don't know how many of us have got a perfect life. Who has a perfect life? If you have a perfect life, just I want you to raise up your hand. If your life could be better, can I see your hand? Oh, okay, okay. So, so it seems we can all identify with this woman that um, our life is in a mess and we wish we can improve on that. This is a story of Jesus. The Bible says that Jesus and his disciples were traveling from Judea to Galilee, and they needed to pass through Samaria. And when they got to Samaria, at the Jacob's well in Sychar, Jesus was tired. This is the human element. Being God, at this point in time, the Bible says he was tired. He was weary, and he needed to rest. 
And as soon as they got to that place, he decided to take a break and rest a little and send his disciples into the city to go and get food so that he can take a little rest. Whilst he was resting, a woman from the city came to fetch water. And when that woman came to fetch water, Jesus requested, can you give me water to drink? And the woman looked at him and said, what do we have in common? You are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. What do we have in common that you ask me of water to drink? And Jesus, having this conversation with this woman, sometimes you know how we judge people before we give them the chance. When you look at somebody, you see the person, and straight away you judge them. You are a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. What do we have in common? And I know that as Christians, sometimes we are guilty of this too. Sometimes when we come to church, we are all looking good and we think, but in between, within us, some, some discrimination goes on. Injustice. And sometimes some of these are unspoken. Sometimes when somebody sits on a pew, another person don't want to sit close to them. When they come in, some, I've been in a church where somebody will claim that you are sitting on my chair. This is my seat. And I want to declare that in this church, nobody has got a seat in this church. So when we go through that experience where we judge people, where we do not give people a chance, the Bible says that Jesus and this woman continue with their conversation, and Jesus went a little bit further. That is why this morning the lesson study says that the Bible cannot be understood by reasoning. You need divine revelation for you to understand the word of God. Because it doesn't make sense. When you are tired and you are taking a nap and you sit there quietly waiting for them to go to town and get you some food for you to eat. And all of a sudden this woman shows up and then you engage this woman in a conversation and all of a sudden you change that conversation and you go on to say that if you know the man that who I am, the man who is talking to you, I am going to give you something, I am going to give you water, that when you drink of this water, you will never what? Test again. Does it make sense when this person is tired and weary, waiting for food, and all of a sudden he is promising somebody water that when they drink that water, they will never what? Test again. That is the reason why when we look at the Bible, when we read the Bible, do not depend on your human wisdom, human reasoning to understand the word of God because it will make sense to you. Jesus being God, change the conversation and straight away move from physical water to spiritual water. That when you drink of this water, you will never what? Test again. The living water. This woman continued on that conversation with Jesus, and Jesus, trying to explain to this woman, says that your life is in a mess. You've had so many husbands, and even the one that you are with is not your own. All of a sudden, this woman is being exposed. All the secret deals of this woman is being what? Revealed. Her life is in a mess. But I want to tell you this morning that when you have that encounter with God, no matter how messy your life is, God is going to change that mess and give you a message. And when God gives you that message, you can't keep it to yourself. Your mess is going to be changed to message. And that message cannot be kept. That is why when somebody had an encounter with God, they are always on fire for God. You cannot have an encounter with Jesus and keep quiet. Because when that transformation takes place in your life and your past is taken away and those who are judging you, it's up to them. And all that you can think of is you look forward to your future. When the devil reminds you of your past, tell them about your future. 
Because he only knows about your past. He doesn't know what the Lord has in store for you. So this morning, as we are preparing ourselves to dine with the Lord, I came here to tell you that God is going to change your mess, your messy life, all the struggles that you are going through, and he is going to give you a message. And when that message comes into your life, your life will never be the same. You will be bold enough to go out there and shout. That is why when we come to church and somebody is making noise, I always say to you, People, leave them alone. You don't know what people have gone through the past week coming here and we are all in tie and suit. You don't know our experience. Some of us are here because of the grace of God. On the road, we could have been in an accident. Our life could have been different. We had a near misses where somebody needs to swerve the car before we can be saved. So when I come to church and after going through all that I was about to be fired at work and God saved me and when I come to church you want me to keep quiet I can keep quiet. Because God is good to me. If God has not done anything to you, if God has not done anything for you and your life is the same, leave me alone. Leave me alone. The ripple effect, the effect that that fire that is burning within me for the grace of God that has been sufficient for me. I can only shout and sing the praises of God. When that transformation takes place, you don't even look at who is watching you. Sometimes when people are shouting, they don't care. Either you are, they are making noise or whatever. If you can't cope, just leave them alone. Because they know the journey that they are on. And the Bible says that when the disciples came and saw Jesus talking to this woman, straight away they were judgmental. What is going on here? And the worst part of it is, you, you, you have sent us to go into the town to get us something for, for all of us to eat. Now we bring the food and we give you something to eat. And you, the same person who sent us into town, says to us that, I'm not going to eat anymore. How? Has somebody been here? Did this woman come with any food? This woman will not give him even water to drink, not to think of food. But Jesus says, yes, I must do the work of the one who what sent me. I must do the work of my father. So that is the reason why I'm saying that reasoning does not make sense when we talk about Christianity. It has to do with divine revelation in order for you to understand that Jesus saw the opportunity at that point in time to minister and he was not concerned about physical anymore. He was more in tune with spiritual realm. And when that transition takes place in your life, there's a change, there's a shift in your life that you don't focus on physical anymore. People can gossip about you. People can say anything about you. It's not about those things anymore. It's about your relationship with God. That is why it says, do not allow anybody to drive you out of church. Because we come to church to worship God. And if you come to church to worship God, whatever somebody may say about you means nothing. Why? Because you have a deeper relationship with your God. You know the reason why you are here. You are here to praise your God. That is why the Bible says, after that encounter with Jesus, the woman left that pot, that pot that she came to fetch physical water, water that would have been finished within just a day or two, and she would have come back and fetched water again over and over. At that point in time, Jesus said to her, I'm going to give you water that when you drink of this water you will never want test again. She left that pot. That's something that sometimes in life we need to leave behind. In as much as they may be necessary, yes we all need water to survive, but the reality is that they are not the most important thing when it comes to spiritual things. There are certain things that may be necessary in physical realm, but in spiritual realm it's not needed. And you need to leave behind. When God takes away your mess, that habit, that relationship, there are certain things that you need to let it go in order for you to move forward. They cannot be part of you anymore. The new journey, the new experience that you're on is a shift, there's a change, there's an encounter, there's a transformation, and you cannot carry that baggage with you anymore. You need to let it go. And the Bible says that she left everything and ran to the town, shouting, calling people left and right, come and what? See. Come and see. And the interesting part of it is, some of these men that she was calling are the same men that she had an encounter with earlier. 
Hmm. But when that transformation takes place in your life, you don't care what, how people are going to judge you because you know what you're talking about. You know your relationship with God. And all that you can do is to shout, come and what? See. Come and see. I've met a man who has told me everything about my life. And if you look at the word that this woman used, says maybe she's maybe the Messiah because it's only Messiah who can do that. And I'm calling you to what? Come and see. The time has come as Christians that we need to call people to come and what? See. The God that we serve is so sweet. Unless you don't trust him, unless you don't believe in him, unless he has not done anything for you, then that is why you can't share with any other person. But if God has done something special for you, you can't keep quiet. You can be proud of him and go about and shout. This morning, we are going to dine with the Lord. Communion service gives us an opportunity for us to be in tune with God. All our mess will be taken away. It's a time of renewal. If there's any service that we need to stay out, if there's any service that we don't want to be part of, it should not be communion because communion is for sinners like you and I. The blood of Jesus cleanse away because the Bible says that there cannot be what? Forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. And the blood has been shed for us. So as Jesus promised this woman that if you drink of this water, you will never what? Test again. I want to tell you that if you partake in this communion, your sins will be what? Forgiven. This is the God that we serve. He's so good. I don't know about you, but I have tested him. That is why Psalm 34 says, oh, what? Test and see that the Lord is what? Good. I want to invite you this hour as we prepare ourselves for this special service. Let communion service has a meaning in your life. And that meaning is for you to change your life. That meaning is for you to be humble. That meaning is for you to have a relationship with God. That meaning is for you to leave that pot behind. That baggage that you came to church with today, that habit of gossip, that family issue, all the problems that you can think of, you need to leave it behind. And then when you are going, you leave and you go lighter. Because you don't carry anything, you can run. And the Bible says that this woman ran into town. And this is the time where you can gossip and not sin. Because you are gossiping about your Jesus. Go around, gossip, run your mouth. Tell everybody about what Jesus has done for you. About the God, about the encounter. And you will never what? Sin. May God bless you all. Thank you, Pastor, for the word. Come and see the ripple effect. Thank you. We have been blessed. Uh, as we, pre we prepare for the foot washing exercise, I'm going to invite you to join me uh, in singing number 318. Lord Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole. I want thee forever to live in my soul. And um, at the singing of the last stanza, we'll separate for the foot washing exercise. We're going to invite the, the children who are not um, participating in the foot washing to stay inside. And the children's corner will take place at that time. Sister Javi, whiter than snow. Let me invite you to join me as we stand to sing this song.
this time we will prepare to wash our feet it is children's story women will be in the back and men will be upstairs amen Boys and girls. Right. Wow, you guys don't sound like you're happy. Happy Sabbath, boys and girls. Okay. How were you guys week? But good? Okay. So I need a chorus from you guys for us to sing. Come on this side. A chorus for us to sing, guys. We need two. Because while the adults wash their feet, we're going to be here. So you guys can go wash your feet and then come back. <laughs> All right. A chorus for us to sing. All right. All right. Jordan, I need a chorus. I need a song for us <laughs> to sing. <laughs> With Jesus in the vessel. We can smile at the storm. That's one and one. We need another one. Come on, guys. Think about it. With Jesus in the vessel, we can smile at the storm. Smile at the storm. Smile at the storm. With Jesus in the vessel, we can smile at the storm. As we go sailing home. Sailing. Jesus in the vessel, we can smile at the storm as we go sailing home. All right, I need you guys to sing and smile, right? We're going to do it one more time. And I want to see you smile when I say smile. Let me see you smile. Yes, because Jesus is in the vessel and we can smile at the storm. <laughs> With Jesus in the vessel, we can smile at the storm. Smile at the storm. Smile at the storm. With Jesus in the vessel, we can smile at the storm. As we go sailing home. Oh, sailing, sailing home. in the vessel we can smile at the storm as we go sailing home 
All right. Jesus loves me, this I know. Since you guys are not giving me one, I'm going to choose one. You guys have one? No. No. All right. You guys know Jesus loves me, this I know, right? All right. All right. I want to hear you guys. One, two, three. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Okay, boys and girls. So, our story for today is about Queen Esther. What is our story about today? Queen Esther. Uh, Ariel, you got to sit up. Fix, fix your dress. Uh-huh. Fix it. Fix it. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, I have a question for you guys. Who do you stay with when you can't be with your parents? Who do you stay with? Okay. I need a, a mic person. Who wants to grab a mic? And, all right. Just grab a mic. Oh, Danny. Danny's going to be a mic, a mic helper. Hi. All right. So, who do you stay with when you can't stay with your parents? My grandma. Huh? My sister. Okay. My aunt's house. Okay. My daddy. Okay. Who else had their hand up? My aunt. My auntie. My sister. My mom. My brothers. My grandma. Okay. My godmother. My nana. My grandparents. Say mama. Say mama. Say mama. Say mama. Okay, wow. So you guys all have people in your life who love you that you can stay with when your parents is not around. So that is great. So Esther's cousin, he cared for her for a long time. Esther was a pretty little girl, and she lived in the land of Persia. When both her parents died, Esther went to live with her older cousin. What was the name of the cousin? Who knows? Mordecai. Yes. <laughs> Mordecai loved Esther and cared for her as if she was his own daughter. As Esther grew to be a young woman, Mordecai taught her all the things parents teach their children. He taught her to be... What do your parents teach you? To be kind, to be helpful. What else? To be grateful and be kind. To be respectful, thankful, to have responsibility. <laughs> to be kind. To be honest. Yes, all these things that your parents did to Mordecai taught her to be brave, to be kind, to be helpful. Someone said to be grateful. And he taught her to love and worship God. Although Esther and Mordecai lived in Persia, they weren't Persian. They were, who know what they were? All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Jews. Jews. Jewish. Jewish. They were Jewish. Yes, they were Jewish. They were Jews, so they were Jewish. And Mordecai didn't want Esther to forget the God of her people. 
When Esther was a young woman, the king of Persia decided to look for a new... He decided to look for what? A new... <laughs> queen. A new queen. Young woman from all over the country were called to the palace. The king would choose a new queen from among them. Esther was one of those young women. Each young woman enjoyed, no, Esther enjoyed a year of special care because, before they went to the king. During this time, they lived in a special part of the king's palace and they were cared for by special helpers. Esther was such a kind and thoughtful girl that she became friends with the one in charge of the girls. He gave her seven special maids. How many special maids? <laughs> How many special maids did he give her? Two? No. <laughs> seven. Yes, he gave her seven special maids. He gave her the best food and the best place to stay. Mordecai worked in the king's palace. He would walk in the garden near where the young woman lived. There he would find out how Esther was and what was happening to her. Finally, it was time for Esther to meet the king. Would he like her? Would he like her more than all the other young women? Would he make her queen? The king did like Esther. Mordecai had raised her well. She was not only beautiful, she was kind and sweet, and she won the favor of the king. The king put a royal crown on Esther's head and made her queen. He gave a great feast for her. He proclaimed a holiday throughout the entire country and gave lots of gifts in honor of his new queen. Mordecai had cared for Esther most of her life, and he didn't stop caring for her when she became queen. Mordecai and Esther were part of God's family, and people in God's family never stop caring for each other. So how can you show others that you care for them? Just like you said earlier, you can be kind, you can be grateful, you can give someone a cup of water. You know, we serve God when we share his love with others, okay? So think of several things you can do. You can that you can help people, not just in your family, but outside of your family. What are some of the things you can do to help others? Clean. Everyone, think of something you can do to help others in your family, your friends. Taking care of people when they're sick. Okay. Studying when there's a test. Okay. You can help to take care of them when they're sick. You can study with them. That's what she said, right? Okay. <laughs> All right. You can pray for them also. You can sing for them. <laughs> you can give them a hug. You show your love to someone in your family when you go home, right? Just show some love to everyone around you, all right? So I have a memory verse I want you guys to say. Everyone there, all right. Uh, I have a question for you guys. When Esther mother and father died, who looked after Esther? Say it together, everyone. Okay. <laughs> Did he take good care of her? Yes. Everyone, together. Yes. What did he do? He taught her lots of things, like... Yes. Yes. 
Yes, he taught her all these things. And most of all, he taught her to do something special, even worship God. He taught her to worship God. So, all right, they're coming back. So, I want everyone to say this. Everyone, you can see this? All right, so read it. Loud, everyone. God's people care for each other. All right, and that's the message I want you to take with you today, okay? And then we have the memory verse, everyone. As brothers and sisters, Hebrews 13, verse 1. One more time. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Hebrews 13, verse 1. Amen, amen. So I need a boy and a girl to pray for us. All right, send up. Come on. Come on. Do you want to pray? Come. All right. Okay. So you got to wait because they were here before you. (laughs) Right here. Go ahead. Thank you, my cat. He'll be safe. And I don't want my cat to die. Amen. 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 Thank you for mommy. And daddy. daddy. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, God, for the life you gave us. You cared about us, and you watched us. And Jesus, God, amen. Amen. Thank you, God, for this day. Thank you. Thank you that this is your Sabbath day today. Please help us when church is over to do good. Please help us to obey your commandments and not eat. And try not to sin. And please help us to spread the gospel in jesus name amen amen dear god thank you for taking care of us to have fun to have respectful and being kind to each another he may bless us he may guide us he coerced the world in jesus name amen amen Heavenly Father, God, I thank for this prayer. Thank God for this holy day that we shall live. And please, God, let us see another day for us to live, God. Please let us have a blessed day. As in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, dear Jesus, thank for this day. Please bless everyone who came to church, God. The, the, the people who came to church are worshiping you, God. Please bless all the people who are sick and can't come here. But thank God you, you have this app that can that people can watch you. God, please bless everyone who's, who's having a bad day. Please bless everyone's parents who is at work and have a good day. Please bless everyone who's sick, has a bad day, has bad days every day, God. Thank you. Thank you for the day you have given everyone, God. Forgive my sins. Amen. 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 All right, now we're going to pick up the offering. Grab your basket. No running. Jesus 
cares for all the children of the world. Jesus died for all the children. We ask that all the women go back to the back so they can pray. Thank you. Amen. We're going to start our song service with number 12. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. How great thou art.
just can't take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sees my soul my Savior God to me Great is thy faithfulness. Hey! 
121, go tell it on the mountain. Thirty-six. There is a fountain.
Let us bow our heads and close our eyes. Lord, you said for us to remember you in this act, Lord. The act that represents you coming on the cross and dying for our sins, Lord. Lord, you did not have to suffer, but you loved us so much that you rather give up your life for us. So today we look at the cross. We don't look at our left, we don't look at our right, but we look at the cross to see how far we have been. But today we have taken the time to ask forgiveness for our sin so that we can be made whole. Thank you for this opportunity, Lord. Be with us, fill us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Please be seated. The privilege is mine to welcome you to the Lord's Supper. This is a commemoration of what Jesus did some 2,000 years ago. We are celebrating the Passover, the Lord's Supper, when Jesus took bread and blessed it in the presence of his disciples, and he gave it to them. And this is highly symbolic. Because we know that Jesus died for our sins. So today we celebrate the Lord's Supper. So welcome to the Lord's table. And I pray that as we participate, as we partake, that we will be filled, we will be revived, we will be rejuvenated to go and do the work that the Lord has called us to do. Welcome.
Our first scripture reading is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and I'm reading from verse 23 to 24. It says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let me invite you to pray with me. Gracious God, Father of mankind, we thank you for sending your son Jesus to be the bread of life that came down from glory. Father, he lived here on this sinful earth and he lived a perfect life. And then he sacrificed himself in our stead. Here we are today, we are commemorating what he did for us 2,000 years ago. God, as we are about to partake of this emblem, the bread that represents his body that was broken for us, pray God that symbolically as we do it, that physically we may be transformed, we may be healed. And Lord, spiritually that we will have a connection, we will have communion and fellowship with you. Pray, God, that we will be energized. We will be motivated to do what you have called us to do, and above all, to live a life of holiness. Please bless this emblem as we partake, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to about 
time has everyone been served has everyone been served oh, yeah. amen and when he had given thanks he broke it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me amen, amen. let's pray Heavenly Father, thank you for this body you've given us, Lord. Help us to accept it for an atonement. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let us eat. Our second scripture reading is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 25 to 26. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your sacrifice that you made for our salvation, Lord. We thank you for your blood that you shed on Calvary, that we can call you as our Father once again. Lord, as we are partaking this emblem, which represents your blood, the songwriter says that it has power. There is power in the blood. So we are seeking for that power, Lord. I pray that if somebody is here who is struggling with physical health, may this emblem be like a balm of Gilead, where it will bring healing to the person, Lord. 
Whatever may be our struggles, Lord, as we meditate on this, especially in our spiritual journey, may we draw closer to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The blood that Jesus shed for me Ah. 
Has everyone been served? In the words of Jesus, this is a new covenant in my blood. This blood of Jesus has the power to make sinner clean. I invite you to partake of it prayerfully, confessing your sins. Amen. Trust and obey, five ninety. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still.
communion service is a very important service in the calendar of us as a Christian. And we know that it's a very sacred service. And it's a time of reflection when we come before the throne of God. So this afternoon, before we end our service, I just want us to spend a few minutes in prayer. I know we are in a season where our young people, those who are in college, are writing exams or preparing for exams and every step of their academic um, journey. So at this time, I would like to invite um, Sister Jamila, can I invite you to come forward? You are going to lead us in prayer, and that prayer focus is going to be on our young people. You are going to pray for them, those who are away in college, those who are here in church, at, at any stage in their academic journey. I know that it's not only academic, some of them struggles with other issues, mental issues, whatever may be. Even those who are going through financial situation, I know that sometimes when you're in college and you cannot afford to pay your fees, they won't even allow you to sit for your exams. And some of us graduated only in college and they won't even give us our certificate until you pay. So I want you to pray for those who are in that situation. Then, Sister Blaze, Sister Blaze, I want to... You, um, invite you to join us. We know that some people are going through health issues. Whatever may be the health uh, situation that you are going through, I want you to just stand. We can't. We don't want to know your story because we don't have any power. We are just interceding on your behalf. So Sister Blaze is going to intercede on behalf of all those who are not well. Even if you want to stand for somebody, a friend, a family member that you know they are not doing well and you want to pray for them. So the second prayer point is going to be for those who are going through health issues. And whatever may be, if you came here this hour, this church today, and you have a burden in your heart, that's something that you are asking God to answer, I just want you to stand for special prayers. And Sister Blaze, you are going to pray for those who are sick and also those who are going to stand, whatever may be their decision. Sometimes as a church, we don't, know what people are going through in their private life. Some people are struggling with all kinds of issues. But when we come to church, we put on a good face so that nobody will see our tears. But the reality is the struggle is real. Mm -hmm. And this is the time that we intercede on each other's behalf. So I want the praise team to lead us to sing one song. Maybe first stanza alone. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with 181. 181. If, if not, then you can choose any song. And then after that, Sister Jamila will lead us in our first prayer, and then Sister Blaze will lead us in our second prayer. 181. Are you familiar with that song? No. Okay, Three, choose any. 309. Yeah, just I go surrender ahead. all. Yeah, okay. Three oh nine, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender all to Him. Gracious Heavenly Father, our Creator, our Sustainer, our Father, our Redeemer, 
Father, you hold so many titles in our life. There's so much that you do and give and keep giving, Father. And we don't have the words today to express our gratitude as we stand and kneel in awe of your presence, in awe of your glory, in awe of your love for each and every one of us. Father, as we are here today, we are blessed to be alive, to see another Sabbath day, to be in good health to be able to walk, to be able to praise your name, to be able to partake in another communion service, Lord. Not out of religiosity, Lord, but out of a need that we see to recommit ourselves to you, to renew our relationship with you, to renew our hearts and remind us of why we are truly here. It's not because we are better than anyone who didn't live to see this moment. But God, it's all because of your grace. From the youngest person here to the oldest, Lord, we don't deserve to be here. Father, we are here acknowledging our wrongdoings, Lord. That none of us are perfect. Lord, that we have committed flaws. That we are human. And yet you love us and accept us anyways. So, Father, today I just want to take a moment to say thank you for the unspoken requests. God, thank you for the blessings, the testimonies that were said when we were together in the back. Lord, procedures that you protected people through, lives that you restored, Father, marriages that you've held together, Father, children who could have been in other places, but they are in your house. Father, whether they're with their parents, Lord, they came with friends, we just want to thank you that they are preserved. Lord, we ask for forgiveness of our sins at this time. Please cleanse us. Renew our minds, Father. Help us to be more aware and more discerning of our words and our actions and our thoughts, dear God. Thoughts that no one else knows, but you know. And may that be enough to convict us, Father, from a place of love. Lord, at this time, I want to lift up our children, starting with our college students who are away, and even those who may not be away, Lord, but they are all going through this time of exams where it's a lot of stress, dealing with peer pressure, dealing with academic stressors, Father. Their mental health, Father, is up and it's down, dear God. And we know that From where we are, there's nothing that we can physically do, but we know from where you sit up high, you see each and every one of them, Lord. You know the areas that they're struggling with, Lord. Please comfort them. Let them know that in moments of difficulty, Father, that they can look to you, that they can cry out to you, that they can talk to you, dear God. Even if it's to say, Father, help me. Father, strengthen my mind. God, help me to remember this material, God. Nothing is too small for you. Thank you for caring about every single part of their lives, dear God. Lord, I pray that you be with our high school students, our middle school students, dear God. Our children in schools at every level, Lord, it's hard. It's hard being a child in this day and age. It's hard to be in school in this day and age, Father. It's hard to be a representative for you in this day and age, Lord, but we know that you are there. You surround their schools every day. Your angels are protecting them and watching over them, dear God. Please continue to do what we can't, Father. The things that we ask and the things that we don't even have the words to ask, I pray that your Holy Spirit may intercede continually on our behalf. I thank you, God, for hearing our prayer. In the name of Jesus, I do pray. Amen. Thank you, dear God, for allowing us to be in your presence at this time of the day. Thank you for your love and your mercy. Thank you for forgiving our sins that we have hurt, we have disobeyed, we have done what is wrong in your sight, and I pray at this time that you will cleanse each one of us from all unrighteousness. Give us a pure heart, dear God. We thank you for the blood we thank you for your body that was shed, that was 
broken for each one of us. We pray at this time that they will, they will restore us and make us anew in you. We thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. And when we ask, the Holy Spirit goes and brings our petition and interpret each one of us, each one of them, on our behalf. For we don't know what to ask, but you know our needs more than we do. Amen. We pray at this time for every one of us standing or kneeling or sitting down in your presence. We each one has a health issue, whether we are walking, whether we are laying down, whether we are at home or in the hospital. Each one of us has health issues. It may be physical, it may be mental, it may be social health. But each one of us, we are sinners, we are sick in need of a healer. May your healing hand be upon each one of us. And although there are those who have issues that are more on emergency like basis. You are the oncologist, dear God. For those who have cancer issues, those who are suffering, dear God, they are taking chemotherapy. They are going on a natural medicine and they have not seen any light. At this time, dear God, I pray that you will do what you have done in the past. What we, when we least expected, your healing hand will be there to restore, to heal, and to be a complete recovery for the glory of your name, dear God. I pray that your hand will be on our sisters who are suffering from cancer. There are many in our midst, dear God, and you know them. I don't want to call their names, but that God, you know them. You know them at this time, dear God, I pray that you will do what you do best. Heal, restore. For the glory of your name again, dear God, we beg that you will intervene. You said, ask. You said, ask. It will be given unto us. We're asking for a miracle. For we know you are a miracle working God. Amen. You are the God who does the impossible. Again, dear God, may your name be glorified in the situation. There are children who are sick in hospitals who are facing cancer. For one member of our family is sick, we all are sick. When our mothers, when our mother is sick, we are sick. Our friends, our family member, our co-worker is sick. We feel the pain, dear God. We pray that your, you will be with each one to comfort, dear God. You have done it in the past, you can do it again. We trust you, dear God. We trust you, dear God, to do as you promise. For you promise for each one of us to be in good health. In good physical health, dear God, in good mental health. You want no one to suffer. Suffering is bad. Suffering is hard. Intervene, dear Jesus. Intervene, dear Jesus. The woman came to you with an issue of blood, and you heal her instantly. Please, dear God, you see each one who is sick today. Heal, comfort, and do for us beyond our expectation. For we ask all this with thanksgiving in the precious name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.
Praise the Lord. I invite you to stand as we bring this profitable time to a close. Just want to thank you for staying with us through this extended service. Indeed, I hope that you have been truly blessed. Okay, um, so we're going to sing, To God be the glory, great things he has done. Uh, number 341, we'll sing the first and the last stanzas. And I just want to remind you that on communion Sabbaths, we usually take up an offering at the door for the poor. So if you have brought your offering for the poor, one of the ushers will be waiting, one of the deaconess will be waiting at the door to lift that offering. To God be the glory, great things he had done. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gates that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father, through Jesus the by your heads for the benediction now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his presence with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and forever let the church say amen, amen. I just want to say a big thank you on behalf of the church to our deacons and deaconesses, Sister Maggie and your team, Brother Phil and your team for the hard work. We do appreciate your sacrifice and everything. And also to the praise team, thank you so much for leading out. We do appreciate you. And to our musicians, may God bless you. And I cannot forget my elders, Eda Pama, Eda Max, may God bless you for your service. And to each and every one of you, without you, there will be no Oak Street Church and communion. So I just want to say that may God bless you and have a wonderful week. Amen. Amen.